What if I told you everything you thought you knew about plants was about to be turned upside down? Imagine pouring your heart into caring for a plant armed with a whole set of rules only to discover that they're based on botanical myths. Look, science is a journey of constant discovery and nowhere is that more true than the world of botany. I have personally reported some of these myths in previous videos thinking that they were ironclad facts, but today I am copying to those mistakes by challenging seven of the most popular but outdated beliefs about plants. All right. <laughs> First up, I'm gonna get a wee bit nerdy, but I think it's important to cover this first because it has tentacles, I guess, that get into a lot of the other myths we're gonna cover. Okay, this is a two-parter. So let's say this is myth 1A and 1B. 1A is the myth that plants use sunlight for energy. Yes, plants need light for photosynthesis. And this might just be me splitting hairs, but this is such a massive oversimplification that I think it's important that we cover the truth about what is actually going on so that you become the best plant parent possible. Because have you ever thought about how that actually works? How does a plant break down energy? The first law of thermodynamics says that energy can't be created nor destroyed. So what is going on here? All right, let me break it down. Plant leaves have structures that are akin to our own skin. The top layer is called a cuticle and this traps water within the plant, which is essential for photosynthesis. Some plants like cacti have thick cuticles to minimize evaporation, whereas others like lotuses have thinner cuticles since they thrive in water and don't really need to worry about water loss. But here's the full picture. The first law of thermodynamics is called the law of conservation of energy and tells us that while energy can't be created or destroyed, it can be converted. So by doing this, the total energy of the universe remains constant. Plants get their water from xylem tubes, which transport it from the roots to the leaves. When the leaves absorb sunlight and carbon dioxide from the air, they mix it with water and create glucose. For this to work effectively, a plant must have enough water, air, and light, which is why watering your plants regularly and dusting their leaves is so crucial for their survival. The glucose produced moves through phloem tubes to the branches, stems, roots, and fruits, where it combines with oxygen to become essentially plant fuel. And that leads me to part B of this myth. For years, people believed that plants only breathe in carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen through the day, and then they reverse the process at night. So plants need CO2 for photosynthesis and O2 for energy, right? The plant gets the CO2 from openings in the leaves called stomata. CO2 gets pulled in through the stomata, pushed under the cuticle to the mesophyll layer, mixed with the light energy, water, and turned into glucose. The glucose then gets mixed with oxygen and turned into fuel. This part of the process is called respiration, which is how I think the plants inhale CO2 and exhale oxygen oversimplification came to happen. Yes, plants pull in carbon dioxide, but they also pull in oxygen just through a different structure. And since plants can store this energy, they don't need sunlight to make it happen and can do it any time of day or night. So it doesn't matter what time of day you're hanging out with your plants, respiration is still happening. The only real impediment is if roots get waterlogged or are in soil that's too compact. Both of these stop them from taking in the oxygen. Okay, complete nerd science myth over. Are you still awake? Good, let's continue with debunking one of the iconic facts we have all heard of, and that is the NASA Clean Air Study. The NASA Clean Air Study suggested that houseplants could purify indoor air by filtering out toxins like formaldehyde and benzene. While it's true that some plants can absorb certain pollutants, the reality is far less impressive. Most studies, including ones conducted in real homes, show that the amount of air cleaned by houseplants is frankly, minimal, compared to the air turnover in our homes through regular ventilation. Basically, relying on plants to filter your air is like filling a swimming pool with a watering can. Sure, it'll work eventually, but it will take forever. So what's the real solution? Regular ventilation. Fresh air is your best friend here. Open windows, use fans, and have a solid HVAC system. Hey, smidge of an update here. I was doing research for work and found this study which said that if you want to improve the ability for your plants to help clean the air, make sure that they have well aerated soil. 
Again, this is, cannot be your only source of air cleaning, but just wanted to give you this little tidbit. So while your plants will definitely bring life and beauty to your space, they can't be your primary air purifier. This is Marv, and he's the subject of my next debunked myth. When I first bought him in 2019, he was known as a split leaf philodendron, but my brain forgot that fact somehow. So I started referring to him as a monstera. A few years ago, when I was doing research, I went back and checked on my history and realized that nope, he was a split leaf. But Marv the split leaf philodendron just didn't have the same good feelings that the alliteration of Marv the monstera did. But I wasn't changing his name because that is a whole thing. Turns out, I was right to forget the taxonomy. Way to go, ADHD brain. But here's where it gets tricky because split leaf philodendrons are a real species. They're just not Monstera deliciosus. What's frustrating is that the name split leaf philodendron gets used interchangeably, which just creates an entire world of confusion. So let's set the record straight. Okay, we're back. The split leaf's scientific name is Thamatophyllum bipinatophyllum, or the <laughs> much easier to say Philodendrum cellum, and is from the same family as the Monstera erisei. And they look very similar if you're not aware of the cellum's existence because it's just not as popular and readily available as the Monstera. The easiest way to tell the difference is by looking at the fenestrations. Now, technically, the split leaf does not fenestrate, but that's nitty gritty details that are getting away from the point. I'll leave links below that get more into that if you want to go for a deep dive. The Monstera deliciosa starts out with heart-shaped leaves that will develop holes over time, and that's known as fenestration. Even while it ages and fenestrates, it's still able to keep the telltale heart-shaped leaves. In my opinion, the split leaf looks much more like its leaf construction splits from one into multiples, if that makes sense. It also has a tapered edge to the splits where monsteras look a little more rounded or blunt. The textures are also a big giveaway. Monsteras are smooth and glossy, while split leaves are like, kind of leathery and textured. All right, diving a little deeper. Split leaves will grow quickly and can reach up to 20 feet as a house plant. While monsteras are slower, they prefer to meander and climb, topping out typically around 10 feet on average. Luckily, they both have the same care requirements, so even if you get it wrong, you should still be able to do okay keeping it alive. Indirect light, well-draining soil, water after the first two inches of soil feels dry. Also a fun fact, the National Garden Bureau has dubbed 2025 the year of the monstera. This includes all plants under the monstera umbrella, so give your deliciosas, perus, esquilitos, obliquas, stendalianas, Thai constellations, elbows, and adansanes a high five for being so well loved. Sorry, mini monsteras, you're great, but a different species, so you're not invited to the party. Next, have you ever heard that placing a tray of gravel filled with water beneath your plant will increase its humidity? I admit I have even advised people to do this before I knew better. Turns out, the reality is that the water from the tray does not effectively increase humidity around the plant. Instead, evaporation occurs only when there's enough space and heat. So if you want to raise the humidity, consider a proper humidifier or group plants together to create a microclimate instead. Next, how about the idea that you need to water your plant on a strict schedule? Now, as someone with ADHD, look, I get it. Sticking to a schedule ensures every plant gets a drink but this myth can actually do more harm than good. The truth is different plants have unique water needs based on factors like size, species, and even the current climate. Science has shown that the best way to determine if your plant needs water is by checking the moisture levels in the soil, not by some arbitrary timeline. Remember, like in myth 1b, too much water will cause roots to stop taking in oxygen, preventing respiration. Your plants will thank you for listening to their cues. Believe me, Breaking this habit will be for the best, and your plants will thank you for listening to their cues instead. Now, <clears throat> here's one that many gardeners swear by. The belief that pruning always stimulates growth. And while it can encourage bushier development, the truth is over pruning can stress the plant, diverting energy away from the growth as it tries to heal. Scientific research indicates that plants utilize energy for repair and recovery. So while judicious pruning has its benefits, it isn't a one size fits all growth strategy. Finally, 
Let's address the assumption that big plants need big pots. Hey, um, so I was editing this video and I had to update this part. Common, common plant wisdom usually says that you should be very cognizant of the pot size that you're using because using a pot that's too big could end up getting your plant waterlogged. It just, it's, a, it's supposed to be a really bad idea. However, there was a study done in 2012. It's 2025 now, by the way, so I can't believe like we're still even talking about this. That said that based on an analysis of 65 studies, doubling the pot size for any container bound plant increased biomass production by 43%. So what should you do about this? I'm going to link to the study, obviously, so that you can check that out. But this common wisdom that you should always keep pots as conservative as possible seems to be a big myth, and it has been possibly debunked for over 13 years now. Okay, that's it. Breaking plant science update. Recently, the USDA released its first hardiness zone map update in over a decade. Climate shifts mean some plants can now survive in regions they couldn't before. Want to deep dive into these changes? Drop a comment and let me know. And if you learned something new today, I'd love if you could give this video a thumbs up and subscribe, because when it comes to plant science, we are all just getting started. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you in the next video.